Hello everyone and welcome back to the second lecture that I'll be delivering to you today um, for the Dower Unit 1 training and this time we're going to move on and focus a little bit more on planet formation. So in lecture 1, just to recap, we looked at the different uh, observations that we use to probe star forming regions in the interstellar medium. We talked about how stars form from the gravitational collapse of molecular clouds and as part of that story we also touched upon the fact that um, angular momentum is conserved during collapse and that naturally leads to the generation of a rotating, rotating flattened structure in the equatorial plane perpendicular to the axis of rotation and also helps in the, in the generation of those jets and outflows. So in the first just little part of this uh, second part of the uh, lecture course, so part two, uh, we're just going to do a little bit of a recap of star formation, so star formation in a nutshell. So we have our molecular cloud. Uh, inside of our molecular cloud we have a, a dense region. This dense region is sufficiently dense and cool. The gravitational collapse is able to uh, overcome pressure support and that starts to collapse from the inside out. And then if we zoom into this inner region here, because of that conservation of angular momentum, we see that the, the envelope starts to uh, feed the star through this flattened rotating structure that we call the protoplanetary disk. And then that spinning up and twisting of the magnetic field lines helps to generate these highly collimated jets that punch through the surrounding envelope and also um, impart momentum onto that molecular gas, driving also an outflow. This whole process for a low-mass star takes around 10,000 to 100,000 years. And then finally, this kind of process is kind of exhausted, if you like, by the supply of material. We run out of envelope material, the envelope starts to disperse, and what we're left with is a star that's now newly born, sitting in the centre, surrounded by this rotating uh, disk of, of dust and gas. And then there's a further... A uh, phase uh, that follows on from this, and that is the coalescence of dust particles uh, within the disk that then start to uh, create planetesimals that then can collide and grow eventually a planetary system orbiting the now newly born star. So in the first lecture course we kind of focused a little bit on, on these phases at the top, and then in the second lecture we're really going to focus a little bit more and how we go from a protostar all the way through to a planetary system. And also what we'll do is we'll touch upon uh, how we detect exoplanets and what we're learning uh, from the demographics of exoplanet statistics on how unique or otherwise our solar system is. So let's now look at this kind of final stage where we finally born our star, our star is born, and we have what we call a pre-main sequence star. It's still gravitationally contracting, so it still hasn't quite uh, made its way onto what we call the main sequence. So these young stars we tend to refer to as pre-main sequence stars. So these young stars are very identified by the fact that they usually have a surrounding uh, protoplanetary disk. And this protoplanetary disk uh, not only allows that redistribution of angular momentum away from the system, it also helps to feed material from the collapsing envelope onto the still forming star. And even at the point where our envelope has dispersed, we still get this accretion through the disk um, that's the feeding material from the disk onto the star. So just to remind you, we did have a, a quick look at uh, some examples of disks in the first lecture. So this is Herbig Harrow 30 again that we looked at in the context of its very beautiful highly collimated optical jet. And as I told you in the first lecture, we know that there's a, a protoplanetary disk sitting around this young star because we can see this dark lane where the dust in the disk has been able to obscure the light from the central star. And we also see this top and bottom scattering surface coming from light being reflected off the top and bottom sides of the disk. Another nice example of an edge-on disk with a jet is this one here, Digital B. So again, in this case, the disk is edge-on. We don't quite see the same bow-like structure of scattered light. What we see instead is the scattered light coming off the outflow cavity walls, but we see this again, beautiful jet 
Here's another example here, our 065B, again our, our disc is edge on, we see some scattering from the surface and the optical jet, and then HK tau, which is down in the bottom here, again we see this dark lane that is the, reveals the presence of a disc that's very close to edge on, obscuring the starlight and some scattering uh, from the top and bottom sides of the disc. In this case, this is a more evolved object and the, and the jet has, uh, has uh, stopped effectively. So we kind of built up a picture of what these uh, young uh, protostars look like. So we have a protostar sitting at the center. We have a circumstellar disk that is this rotating flattened structure, the spreading of material. We have a bipolar jet, which we can see here, which is along the, the polar regions of our protostar. We have a bipolar outflow, which is in blue here, which is a material dragged away by the jet, creating a cavity through collapsing envelope. And then finally, this object is sitting uh, within uh, a dusty envelope. And everything is, is of course, also rotating because um, our initial cloud that collapsed had a little bit of angular momentum and that has been obviously retained by the system so everything is in rotation around this uh, forming star, this protostar. So how do these structures arise? Well part of the, so, so they arise from the conservation of angular momentum and mass um, and also these jets that are generated and inject energy into to the ISM also uh, generating turbulence as well. So how do these complex structures actually arise when we started off with something that looked a lot, looked very homogeneous, if you like, on, on large scales? Well, part of the story is in, uh, um, <clears throat> again, one of the properties of the molecular clouds before the molecular cloud actually, actually collapse. So this is like a, another little view of that schematic that I had uh, in the previous slide, except now we're kind of taking a slice through the protostar. So again, we have our protostar here, we have accretion uh, through, through the disk, we have a, um, a flattened rotating structure in large scales, we have our jet, our high velocity jet, and we also have our, our low velocity outflow. And you can see that this structure has almost like something that looks a little bit like an hourglass morphology. Okay, so we have the, the outflow kind of goes like this away, and then we have a lot of the density and a lot of the material is actually sitting towards the center of the object, towards the protostar. And what we think arises in, in the morphology of um, our protostars is the role of really magnetic fields. And I hinted at that when I talked about how jets are generated. So if you imagine that you have a large molecular cloud, it's threaded by a fairly unidirectional magnetic field. When that cloud collapses, the field lines are effectively frozen in the cloud, so when it collapses, it drags all those field lines along with it. And the cloud is going to collapse um, in the um, strongest sense towards the, the center where the protostar is forming. So we have a large scale magnetic field that then ends up getting quite pinched in towards where the protostar is actually forming. And at the same time, everything is rotating. So you end up getting the, the field lines twisting. So if you take a look at the, the slice through a protostar here, and you have a look at the large scale morphology of the magnetic field uh, for, for a molecular cloud that was threaded with a magnetic field in the first place, you can see that it very much kind of very well matches the morphology of not only the flat rotating uh, disk, but also the generation also of the jets and the outflows. So we think that a lot of this, um, especially this bipolar structure that arises from, from star formation is due to the role of magnetic fields, those magnetic fields having been uh, present in the, in the molecular cloud before it formed. So magnetic fields very, very important for shaping uh, star formation. The other role that magnetic field lines have is that, again, we think that a lot of that magnetic flux that was present in the original molecular cloud is preserved actually down to the stellar, stellar scales. So the stars themselves actually end up with sometimes quite strong, sometimes also quite complex magnetic fields. And this is a really good thing because this is actually what helps to drive accretion from the surrounding circumstellar disk onto the star.
And this is a nice little animation showing you how that happens. So we have a magnetic faint line has connected here with the disc, and material from the disc has been able to be funneled along that magnetic faint line, uh, enabling it to reach onto the star. And if we look at the bottom here, we're about to see another um, accretion burst, if you like, coming from uh, disk material being fed along a magnetic fate line connected to the star, allowing that material to make its way from the disk onto the star. And this is really important because this is what helps keep the star fed with material from not only the collapsing envelope at early times, but also through the disk um, at later times. So this uh, material that's being pulled along these quite strong magnetic field lines um, end up in very, very bright emission. And that's because the material is being heated by friction. This is just a nice little video showing you what friction can do um, as a heating mechanism. So you can see this Formula One car, which is doing donuts. Um, the tires are being frictionally heated through their interaction uh, between the tires and the ground. And the material that's feeding a young star from a disc is being heated in very much the same way. And this is a little schematic of how this is happening here. And this also explains why at the very start of lecture one, we could see those very young stars were being picked up in X-ray emission, if you remember from the first slide in lecture one. So here we have our circumstellar disc, here we have our gaseous disc, and the material from the gaseous disc, so this very warm disc that's sitting very close to the star, is being funneled onto the star through these uh, magnetic, magnetic field lines. And this uh, terminal velocity onto the star is very, very high, of order 100 kilometers per second. That's well beyond the sound speed, so this material is very shocked. Um, it's um, heated by uh, frictional uh, accretion, uh, so it's very, very hot and very bright. So even in cases where we maybe can't see the disk, and sometimes that's the case, we can see signatures of accretion by looking at spectra of the star itself. So here's a very good example of where we can identify an accreting star, which has a, a surrounding circumstellar disk. In the case that we have a, a star that's not accreting, uh, that star would have this type of spectrum here. So we're looking at the spectrum from 2000 to 6000 angstrom, so from the UV uh, through to, to the visible. And for this star here, DK tau A, that's actually the spectrum in the black line, you can see that if we look at short wavelengths, so between 2000 and 3000 angstroms, or 200 and 300 nanometers, you can see that this accreting star is brighter than a non-accreting star by between uh, two to three orders of magnitude. And it's due to this fact that the presence of the disk um, and the interaction of the stellar magnetic field lines with the disk allows disk material to be fed onto the star, it's shocked, it's very, very hot, it's very bright, and that makes the star much brighter at UV wavelengths and X-ray uh, wavelengths than it otherwise would be if there was no disk. So another way to kind of identify these young stars. And here's a nice image, actually, again, of the pillars of creation in the uh, Eagle Nebula, where we're looking at the optical wavelength light image, where we can see, again, these, these pillars, these uh, pillars of dark, dense, uh, molecular, dusty, clouds that have been able to survive the blast waves from, from the nearby massive stars. Uh, and in the coloured uh, point sources, they're actually the young stars that are sitting in this nebula that are still actively accreting material from their vicinity. So whilst we may not have the ability to you know, image the disks themselves in these uh, stars, we can see that the stars are much brighter than they would be at X-ray wavelengths telling us that they're still accreting material from a protoplanetary disk. So, so these disks, as you might imagine, we also call accretion disks because they have this important role of helping not only to redistribute that angular momentum, helping the star to stabilize, but they also help to feed material through themselves um, on feed the star. Um, these disks are geometrically thin. So this is just a little cartoon of one here. So we expect that their, their height or their depth, if you like, is significantly less than the radius. So they really are very, very thin. And the orbital velocity is also close to Keplerian. Um, and Keplerian velocity arises just from the balance of forces, again, of material in orbit around a gravitational potential well. So you have the force of gravity acting inwards, and you have the centrifugal force acting outwards. 
And if a body is in Keplerian motion at a particular uh, orbital radius, then those forces are balanced. So effectively, these disks are in balance, if you like, uh, around uh, the star, which is their gravitational potential well. Uh, I write close to Keplerian here because the disk actually does feel a bit of its own gas pressure. So it's actually moving slightly sub-Keplerian because there is a retarding force due to the, the disk feeling its own gas pressure. And then just to remind you, this is what a, a Keplerian velocity profile looks like. So it's a 1 over a square root of r behaviour in the azimuthal velocity. And so the material very close to the star is moving significantly faster than material uh, further away from the star. And we can actually see the evidence of this, uh, the disk of material, if you like, that was around the young sun before our planets formed because it's actually encoded in the orbital velocities of the planets in our solar system. So here we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and plotted are the orbital velocities of our planets versus their semi-major axis in astronomical units, where you can see the Earth is at one astronomical unit, which is how the astronomical unit is defined. And if I over plot a one over square root of our profile on here, Keplerian velocity profile, you can see that the planets very well match up with that uh, Keplerian profile. And this is good news, of course, because if they were not moving at the Keplerian velocity, they actually wouldn't be in a stable orbit and they would be either moving in to speed up or moving uh, out to um, slow down. So let's now take a little bit of a closer look at the protoplanetary disks themselves. So this is just another few examples. We've already met Herbic Harrow 30 with its beautiful edge-on disks, scattered light surface and optical jet. Here's another really nice uh, example of uh, an edge-on disk here where we cannot see the disk itself, but we can see it through the fact that it's obscuring the light coming from the central star but we can see the scattering from, from the top and the bottom surfaces. Here's another one that's uh, edge on we've already met, another one DG Tau B as well, where we're, we're looking mainly, I think, here at the, at the outflow cavity walls. So in all of the images that you're looking at here, we're not seeing the disk directly. We're seeing the disk in, in the fact that we cannot see the star. So we know that there must be some dusty material sitting between us and the star, that obscures the light from the star. And that's how, how we infer the presence of a disk. Strong evidence for a disk, of course, is also in the, the scattered light that we see coming from, from the top and the bottom surfaces. And actually, the presence of a jet is also very good um, evidence for a disk because we need that kind of spinning up um, of the, the faint lines at the fast velocities that you have uh, in the inner region to actually create the optical jet. Now, in these images, we're looking at uh, its infrared, so it's near infrared wavelengths that, that we're looking um, at these objects. So we can see scattered light at optical wavelengths, and we can see scattered light also at near infrared wavelengths. If we want to directly detect the disk itself, the disk is actually very cold. So the disk is mainly made out of quite cold dust and molecular gas. Uh, so if we want to directly detect thermal emission from the disk, then we have to go to longer wavelengths. And in the case that we really want to resolve the emission from the disk, we need to also use interferometry. And one of the instruments that we use for this is a, an instrument called ALMA, which stands for Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. And ALMA is a huge array of uh, uh, radio telescopes um, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, which is sitting at five kilometers altitude to get above as much of the atmosphere as possible. And ALMA is able to have sufficiently long baselines that it can actually get down to a few astronomical units resolution uh, to detect dust thermal emission uh, from disks around nearby young stars. So this is really, really high resolution imaging. We weren't really able to do until we had ALMA. And of course, if future radio um, astronomy, uh, future radio arrays, such as the SKA and the NG uh, Next Generation VLA, will be able to do very, very similar imaging to this, except at, at radio wavelengths, at centimeter wavelengths. At, we're at millimeter wavelengths here. So we're looking at six protoplanetary disks around six nearby young stars. We cannot see the star directly because it's actually incredibly faint at millimeter wavelengths. We can only see the thermal emission coming from 
the dust grains present in, in these discs around these young stars. And the first thing that you will notice is that the, the dust in the disc is not smooth, it actually has a lot of substructure. Sometimes it's quite simple substructure, such as a, in this disc here, 169142, where we have two rings. HD 97048 also has two rings. This is HL Tau, which has multiple concentric rings of, of dark and bright emission. And here is TW Hydra, where again we see these very, very defined uh, gaps in emission that we think is due to missing dust. Now one of the theories for why we see a lot of substructure in the thermal emission from the dust grains in these disks is that, is that we're actually seeing evidence of planet formation happening already. So if you imagine in this gap here in TW Hydra, oh, going the wrong way. Let's go back again. So in this gap here in TW Hydra, uh, if there, there, there could be a planet there could be a gas giant planet and that planet has been sufficiently massive to actually open up a gap in the disk and has swept up all of the material in its orbit creating this gap, this highly concentric gap. So one of the theories for why this dust thermal emission has these, this very highly structured uh, emission morphology is that we're actually seeing indirect evidence for the presence of planets in the act of forming uh, in these protoplanetary disks. And this really wasn't possible until we had the long baseline, uh, long baseline um, um, observations uh, with ALMA. So we actually can do similar resolution imaging also in the optical, except now we're not looking at thermal emission from the dust grains. We're looking at scattered light coming from the surface of the disk. Um, and this is a really nice array of images from VLT Sphere which is uh, some of the highest resolution uh, scattered light images that we're able to do at the moment. And these are, again, 10 different protoplanetary disks. So we have more massive disks uh, at, the, uh, at the left here towards more uh, solar type disks around solar type stars towards the end. Here again, you can see TW Hydra again, where again in the scattered light, you can see that there's a lot of substructure. Some of these disks also show these what we call grand design spiral arms. And we think again that this is indirect evidence from planets actively forming in this disk. So if you have a companion either embedded within the disk or outside of the disk, if it's sufficiently massive, it can create spiral density waves um, in the uh, uh, disk gas density that then is able to trap the dust grains uh, in their wake and create these kind of beautiful spiral structures. So these disks that we see around young stars are not smooth. They have a lot of substructure that could be due to the fact that these disks are in, in the act of forming planets. So another way that we can directly but also indirectly detect the presence of a protoplanetary disk is using molecular lines. So um, disks are molecular objects and because they're cold and they're relatively dense, so the atoms like to be in molecules and chemistry that happens at low temperatures and high densities is very efficient at converting atoms into molecules. So here you see some of the most common tracers that we use for protoplanetary disks. We have CO, we have 13 CO in which the 12 carbon has been replaced by 13 carbon. And then we have another what we call isotopolog C18 where the 16 oxygen has been replaced by an 18 oxygen. And we'll actually come back to some of these line profiles in, in the workshop as well. So uh, and what you're looking at here is the emission coming from these molecules as a function of uh, velocity. So um, we, this is the, the dotted line represents the rest velocity of the source. And you can see that these line profiles have quite a lot of structure. So they're quite broad. And also in some cases, especially for GG tau, they're actually quite strongly double peaked. And you can see this for DM tau as well, especially for the 13 CO. Uh, you have this double peak structure. The line here from DM Tau, I think, is coming probably from, from an outflow or jet from the young star. So why do the molecular lines from a protoplanetary disk have this double peaked, uh, a broad, quite broad line profile? Well, again, um, once we've been able to actually resolve the molecular emission coming from the disk, um, it kind of reveals that um, the Keplerian nature of, of the, of the uh, rotating gas, if you like, in the disk. So the fact that you have emission in Kepler the fact that you have a disk in Keplerian rotation, 
where in the inner regions it's moving much faster and in the outer regions it's moving slower. If you imagine that you have a disk of material that's inclined to the line of sight on the sky, one part of the disk is going to be moving towards you, one part of the disk is going to be moving away from you. And that creates a Doppler shifting in the line profile. So the um, emission coming towards you is moving faster, is blue shifted. The emission going away from you is uh, moving slower and is red shifted. So that's what creates these quite broad line profiles and also these quite uh, distinctive double peaked uh, uh, line profiles, as we call them. Of course, now with uh, interferometers like ALMA, we can actually resolve the emission across the disk. So these are spatially unresolved, but spectrally resolved lines. But now we can do both spatial and spectral, um, you know, resolved observations. And this is an image with ALMA towards uh, the disk around a young star, HD 100546. And this is again the CO line, but this is now the three, three to two transition, so slightly higher transition than the line profiles in the background. And this is the velocity of the gas as a function of, you know, as a function of distance away from the star. So we're fully spatially resolving the emission coming from this disk. And you can see here that towards the south, the emission is moving towards us, it is blue shifted. And towards the north, the emission is moving away from us, and so is red shifted. So we can also like map uh, what the emission looks like across the, the disk and also get a sense of what the, uh, the inclination and position angle is of the disk on the sky as well. So a huge amount of information that's encoded in these uh, spectrally resolved observations that we can now do. So these disks we can uh, observe in various different ways. So we've talked about how we can sort, we can see them indirectly by looking at scattered light, and we can see the fact we can see them indirectly because they obscure the light from the star, or indeed they may even obscure the light from from background stars. We can see them directly as well now, and we can actually resolve their emission directly by using interferometers like ALMA um, that is detecting the thermal emission coming from across the disk. The disks are cold, so they're reasonably bright at submillimeter wavelengths. And we can also use scattered light observations that also resolve uh, the scattering surface across the disk um, that has revealed, both of these resolved observations have revealed that these disks are not smooth structures, they have a huge amount of complexity and substructure that seems to indicate indirectly the presence of forming planets. So, so these structures are really important because they are where planets will form. And our solar system would have formed in a disk around the young sun, much the same as we're looking at here, which is the dust thermal emission from a very famous object now called HL Tau, which was the first object where we really saw this very, very detailed substructure. And just to give you a sense of scale uh, on the substructure that we see in HL Tau, this is the size of our solar system on the same scale as HL Tau. So we are really, really able to map the thermal emission from dust grains on size scales within the size of our own solar system. Um, so we're really mapping the dust emission within where the planets are actively forming in these protoplanetary disks. So how do these planets form and why might they arise in these types of substructures that we're seeing, not only in the dust thermal emission, but also in scattered light? Now, in order for us to actually see planets, see the impact of planets on their disk, the planets have to be really massive. They have to be effectively gas giant planets. We wouldn't really be able to see the effect of an Earth-sized planet or Earth-mass planet on its protoplanetary disk because the planet is so small, it's, it's not sufficiently massive to significantly perturb the surrounding structure of the, of the disk within, it, within which it's forming. But we can see the impact of Jupiter-mass planets on the disk in which it is forming. So there's two different, and we, and we think that a lot of these structures that we're looking at in protoplanetary disks are driven by gas giant planets, not terrestrial uh, type planets uh, like the Earth. So there's two different modes of this gas giant planet formation that may impact again on the structure that, of the disk that we see um, with telescopes. So we've got one model which is called the accretion model, which is in the top panel here. And here we have the central star and we have our dusty gassy disk, dusty gaseous disk, which is in complarian orbit about the star. And the dust grains in this disk stick together 
and they grow sufficiently large that they start to form kilometer-sized planetesimals and these kilometer-sized planetesimals grow into embryos that are then become sufficiently massive to accrete a gaseous envelope. So you can imagine this is kind of like a hierarchical growth scenario. So we start off with small dust grains, we form a sea of planetesimals, these planetesimals become embryos that then are sufficiently massive to start to carve uh, gas gaps in the protoplanetary disk. And you can see here that in this little cartoon, you can see how you get these concentric rings or concentric gaps from the most massive objects that are forming in the protoplanetary disk. And then finally, you end up with your, sometimes it can be quite chaotic, uh, planetary system at the end. And this is what we call the core accretion model. First, we build a rocky core, then we accrete gas, and at that point, the the planet's actually able to carve gaps in the protoplanetary disk, which is what we see with telescopes. In the gas collapse model, this is much more similar or analogous to how stars form. So we start off with our, our gaseous protoplanetary disk and Keplerian rotation about its uh, central star. We have a clump that forms in the disk. These clumps can form if the disk is sufficiently massive and also cold. Um, because um, we need um, the force of gravity to overwhelm those other forces that are trying to push the, cloud, the clump apart. So that's things like Keplerian shear um, and things like uh, uh, thermal pressure as well. So you get this clump starts to collapse. It becomes a self-gravitating planet. It excites spiral density waves, as you can see here, as it interacts with the protoplanetary disk. So again, in those scattered light observations, you can see that we, we see potential evidence of spiral density waves. And the other thing that this gas giant does is it starts to create a, a cavity in the gas as well as it sweeps up material in its orbit. So you can see, similar to this hierarchical growth model, we also might expect there to be quite uh, concentric and quite deep cavities carved uh, in, in the disk as this gas giant planet is forming. Now, both of these modes of, of giant planet formation can happen and whether or not one of the other happens really depends on the property of the protoplanetary disk. We really only expect gravitational instability, or gravitational collapse planet formation, to happen in the most massive and the coldest disks. It is likely that, that most planets actually form via the top mechanism because we know all disks have dust and gas. But nonetheless, both modes can actually create these concentric uh, structures that we then see in uh, images of thermal emission uh, from dust grains with ALMA. So let's take a little bit of a look of, at the solar system now because um, it is one, we have a very unique view of the outcome of planet formation just by looking at the morphology of our own solar system. So just to remind you what that looks like, we have our sun in the center and then we have the inner rocky terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Uh, the rocky terrestrial planets are kind of distinguished from the outer giant planets by the presence of this asteroid belt. The asteroid belt are rocky leftovers, so basically uh, rocks that were left over and didn't quite make it into planets. And then beyond, beyond the asteroid belt, we have the giant planets, the two gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is the most massive planet in our solar system. And then the two ice giants, which are farthest away, which are Uranus and Neptune. And then beyond the ice giant planets, we have another kind of remnant disk, if you like, of Kuiper belt objects. And whilst the asteroid belt is full of rocky objects, the Kuiper belt objects are full of icy objects. And we think that this is the source of comets that make their way into the inner solar system sometimes and come and pay us a visit, get warmed up by the sun, and those ices sublimate, and then we're able to, to see them um, with telescopes. So... It's an interesting thing to think about. Why do we have an inner, why does our inner, our inner solar system only have terrestrial rocky planets, but our outer solar system has these giant planets, right? And part of the um, answer kind of lies in what we think the structure of the disk around the young sun was before the planets formed. And we've been able to build a picture of what the structure of that disk is um, and that, that picture is called the minimum mass solar nebula. Um, and this is basically the distribution of material that we think was present around the young sun 
within which our planets formed from. So this minimum mass solar nebula was thought to be a few dozen times the mass of Jupiter. So the disk around the young sun started off with actually a significantly more massive reservoir uh, than the kind of total planetary mass uh, that we have currently in the solar system. And this matter was distributed in the original disk around the young sun and it was uh, consisting of dust and gas. Um, but as you move away from the star, the composition of the disk changes. So if the disk is warmest, closest to the star, and gets gradually colder, the farther away from the star you become. So the inner disk is warm, the outer disk is cold. And one of the most fundamental concepts in planet formation theory is the concept of the snow line. So at some point in the planet forming region of a disk, you're going to reach a temperature below which water can no longer exist in the gas phase and will freeze out onto the surface of those dust grains creating icy coated dust grains. So this boundary, this temperature boundary that we have, that depending on the pressure of the disk is between 120 and 170 Kelvin, that's what we call the snow line. Within the snow line, water is in the gas phase. Beyond the snow line, water is in the ice phase. And this actually is really important when we think about the inner rocky terrestrial planet forming region and the outer gas giant and ice giant planet forming region. So a person called Hayashi was the one who came up with the concept of the minimum mass solar nebula. And again, this is quite a few decades ago, but kind of persists. So what they were able to do was can basically make a map of the mass distribution in the disk around the young sun before the planets formed by looking at the distribution of planets in the solar system today. So they came up with the surface density, uh, expression for the surface density of gas in the disk, which follows this uh, law here. So R is the radius of the disk in units of astronomical units. And then this expression is in units of grams per centimeter squared or mass per unit area. They also come up with an expression for the uh, amount of solids. You can see here, this has got a slightly different expression. So 7.1 times F snow, this F snow factor. Again, this is a function of R and you can see this has got an R to the minus three halves profile. So it's declining as you go away from um, the star. Um, and this F snow factor dictates then a, a, a kind of a discontinuity in the mass of solids that you have within the snow line where this factor is one and beyond the snow line where this factor is 4.2. And just to kind of relate what we mean by, by surface density or mass per unit area, in order to get the total mass of the disk, you would multiply the surface area by the differential for an annulus of material, so 2 pi dr, between a radius of zero and a radius of r, and that gives you the mass of the disk. So the surface density just tells you the distribution of material uh, with, re with respect to area as a function of distance away from the star. So you can see at the location of the snow line, you get this jump in a factor of four between the amount of solids that you have. Within the snow line, you only have rock, and beyond the snow line, you also have rock and ice, because all the water that was present there has frozen out as ice onto the surfaces of dust grains. And this is what the schematically, the uh, minimum mass solar nebula looks like. So we have radius on a log scale and astronomical units on the x-axis, and we have surface density, mass per unit area, and units of grams per centimeter squared on the y-axis. And this is the gas uh, surface density profile, and this is the solid surface density profile. So you can see that it's a factor of about 100 or so less, uh, and, but follows the same one over um, r to the three halves, and it declines. And then at the snow line, which you can see here is between two and three astronomical units, we see get this jump up in the amounts of solids available, because we have not only rock available for building planets, we also have rock and ice as well. So we think that the snow line in our solar system discriminated between the inner rocky planet forming region where we had no ice and planets could only form from rock and um, beyond the snow line where we had rock and ice that basically gave us a factor of four jump in um, material available that allowed us to grow those cores that we need for capturing gas um, and making a gas giant planet. So that's why the snow line is a very important concept in, in planet formation.
So let's kind of go back to that first process in forming planets, which is really about having these tiny dust grains that are present in the disk grow and uh, end up as kilometer-sized planetesimals that then create those embryos uh, that we need for forming either terrestrial or gas giant planets. So we think that this uh, initially starts just very simply with, with simple collisions and sticking. So we start off with uh, tiny fractal dust grains, they collide at quite low velocities and they come together to form uh, more compact structures or um, we may even get uh, some fragmentation happening if the relative velocities of the, of the two dust grains are uh, high, sufficiently high. So, so we think that this starts with just simple sticking. We make fractal structures that are held together by van der Waals forces. Um, and depending on the relative velocities, these may be destroyed, but obviously some of them must, must survive. And we kind of have evidence of these very st fractal structures from interplanetary dust grains one of image of which you can see here. This is about a micron across, and you can see that it's very, very fluffy. It's not like a spherical uh, dust grain. It's very fluffy and very, very fractal. So the first steps of growth, we think, are pretty well understood. We can grow to micron-sized, um, even millimeter sizes, just by this uh, simple um, sticking. So once we kind of reach those millimeter sizes, there's two hypotheses about how we kind of grow to bigger sizes. The first hypothesis is that we have a fairly quiescent nebula, a presolar nebula, so another name for the disk around the young sun. If that was quite quiescent, so there wasn't a lot of stirring, there wasn't a lot of um, mixing, then all of the dust and small particles settle into a very thin layer so we get like a very, very, so the gas is uh, throughout the disk, but the dust settles into a very thin layer, what we call the dusty subdisk. And then because the dust to gas mass ratio becomes so high, um, this becomes gravitationally unstable to clumping, and the dust grains clump together, and that actually allows them, just through gravitational attraction, to form planetesimals. So in this hypothesis, if you have a very quiescent nebula, you can grow from millimeter to centimeter sizes all the way up to kilometer sizes very, very quickly just through gravitational uh, clumping and collapse. And once you have your sea of planetesimals that are around a kilometer in size or so, you then grow to bigger sizes just through simple collisions between those kilometer size bodies. And you can think of again the asteroid belt as being, you know, the kilometer size bodies that didn't end up making their way into a planet. <coughs> Now in the second hypothesis, if the nebula is turbulent, so there's a lot of um, mixing and stirring, what that means is that the dust grains and the gas stay very well coupled together, and growth can really only occur through collisions with themselves. So, so you have millimeter size or centimeter size grains, can only collide to grow. Now there's real problems with this second hypothesis because we know that if you want to get from centimetre to kilometre sizes there's, there's barriers along the way. Um, if you take two centimetre sized dust grains and you collide them with the same velocity that we expect in a, in a protoplanetary disk, they actually bounce rather than stick. And this is a real problem for planet formation theory because this bouncing barrier as we call it means that once you have you know, millimetre to centimetre sized pebbles in your disk, you can no longer grow through collisions to kilometre sizes. But if, the, if, this, if this does happen, um, then this must happen very quickly, but we really don't, don't yet understand the physics um, of this process. <coughs> Some of the evidence that we have from observations is kind of pointing to hypothesis one as actually being the most likely hypothesis. So then whenever you, you reach your kilometre sized bodies, as I said before, gravity then just takes over and it's mutual gravitational perturbations that become important. So once you're kilometre sized bodies, things can get captured and you're able to kind of grow to bigger sizes with, without any issues. So then how do you grow your gas giant planet? Well, let's go back to that core accretion scenario because that's kind of what we're talking about. We don't think that the solar nebula um, was massive and cold enough to actually form planets by gravitational instability. We kind of think that core accretion was probably the most likely way that the gas giant planets in our solar system formed. So let's imagine we're forming a Jupiter mass planet. So we've, we've grown our kilometer sized planetesimals, gravity then takes over and they're able to then collide and grow. And 
Where we get a gas giant planet like Jupiter from is when the mass of what we call this embryo reaches about 10 Earth masses. So we have a 10 Earth mass core. And you can see here, this is the time on the x-axis and we have the mass and units of Earth masses on the uh, y-axis. So for the first kind of million years, we get this embryo formation. And then what happens is that um, these embryos are sufficiently massive that they um, can basically be isolated and they, they don't get disturbed or, or disrupted in any way. So this is what we call embryo isolation. So these embryos are very, very happily orbiting within the disk of dust and gas uh, in the protoplanetary disk. And then over uh, a few hundred, uh, sorry, a few million years or so, what starts to happen is that this embryo starts to accrete gas and it can do it very, very quickly. So uh, once it reaches 10 Earth masses, it creates a gravitational potential well that can then capture gas. So for the next kind of five to seven million years, it starts to grow through capture of gas. And then finally we reach by eight million years here, sufficiently massive that you get this runaway gas accretion. So you can see here that this is almost an exponential growth towards the, the end of this uh, eight million years. So we start to grow very, very slowly. And then finally we get runaway gas accretion because the potential energy of the planet is so large, it's able to capture gas very readily in this runaway process. And then finally the mass of our planet stops. So you can see here, at about 80 Earth masses, when the supply runs out. So effectively, either the planet is no longer talking to the disk and can't capture gas from the disk, or perhaps the disk has dispersed just through radiation from the central star, and there's basically a supply. There's no supply of material anymore. So really the first step is being able to grow this 10 Earth mass uh, embryo, and then we get this phase of, first of all, slow gas accretion followed by runaway gas accretion, the limit of which is a supply limited, either through, through a gap carved by the planet, so it's no longer talking to the disk, or by the, the disk itself uh, dispersing. And this is exactly how we think Jupiter formed within the minimum mass solar nebula around the young sun. Okay, how are we doing for time? So for the next few minutes, um, I just want to touch on what we're learning from the study of planets around other stars, and, and that's what we call the exoplanets. And this has really been one of the major growth areas in astrophysics over the past uh, couple of decades. Uh, we actually only detected the first exoplanet back in the 1990s. Um, we only detected the first planet around a main sequence star in 1995. And we also only detected the first atmosphere of a planet around another star in the year 2000. So, you know, over the time scale that astrophysics has existed, this is actually really relatively uh, new stuff. And at the moment, we know of more than 4,800 planets orbiting other stars. So there's various different ways that we can actually see stars around uh, other, <coughs> sorry, planets around other stars. And uh, by far the two most successful methods are two uh, indirect methods, if you like, one of which is called the radial velocity method. Um, that's where we can actually, if we take a spectrum of the star, and we look at the Doppler shifting of spectral lines from the star, we can infer the, we can infer the presence of an orbiting mass uh, about that star. And then the other way <coughs> um, that's very, very successful is by uh, photometry, uh, and that's the transit method that you can see down here. So this, uh, the numbers down here are, are really out of date, so this is back in <coughs> the year 2000, but still a nice schematic of how we look for planets is the transit method, and that's where we, we, we serendipitously find a planetary system that's edge on to the line of sight, and then as the planet's orbiting the parent star, we see a periodic dip in the light as the planet passes in front of the star. So radial velocity, we're exploiting kind of the gravitational pull of the planet on the star and the Doppler shifting of lines. Transits, we're exploiting the fact that as a planet passes in front of its parent star, it's blocking uh, some fraction of the light. Uh, another way that we can try to see planets around other stars is to try to detect the light coming from them directly. Uh, but then that raises an interesting question about what's the source of emission from the planet. Um, so the most kind of intuitive source of, of emission is actually reflected light. So, so planets are slightly reflective, some planets are more reflective than others. So for example, Venus is highly reflective, 
That's why it's the brightest thing that we can see in the night sky other than the, the sun and the moon. Um, planets like Jupiter are less reflective. Planets like the Earth are some, a, a little bit in between. So I think the, the albedo of the Earth is about 0.3. Um, and this is literally just the light from the star bouncing off the planet and coming towards the telescope. So you can think about first reflected light. So we're directly detecting the planets. The other methods that we talked about are indirect. So you can actually relate the luminosity of the planet to the star through this expression here, uh, which is rp squared, so the radius of the planet squared, divided by 4a squared, where a is the semi-major axis of the planet. Um, and the reason that you can do this is all we're doing is we're uh, taking the ratio of the areas. So uh, the um, cross-sectional area of the planet as seen by the star is pi r p squared, whereas the star is emitting light in, in 4 pi um, a squared. So, so the light that's reaching uh, the planet um, is diluted geometrically by 4 pi a squared, which is a geometric, which is the uh, distance away from, from the star, the orbital radius, if you like. Uh, now, if you, if you do this calculation, and we'll do this in the workshop, the reflected light is incredibly faint, and it's arguably very difficult or even impossible to do this with current technology, and we'll talk about that in, in the workshop. But we are actually able to see directly planets around other stars uh, by looking at the planets themselves. And one of the first objects that we found was this Fulmahope B planet here. You can see that we've been monitoring this for quite a few years. So this is the, the position of the planet in 2004, and this is the position of the planet in 2006. Now the star itself is really, really bright, so the only way that we're able to pick up emission from this planet is by obscuring the light from the star using what we call a coronagraph. And you can see that it's not perfect. Some of the light from the star actually is able to leak out past this block, this coronagraph. But Given that we've been monitoring this for some time, we can we can we know this is a planet. We know this is a planet about this star because it's co-moving with the star, so the proper motions are the same, and we can also see that it's a Kemplerian rotation uh, about the star. Now, this planet was found to have ten to the seven minus seven times the brightness of, of the sun, um, and if you work it out, it's about a hundred times brighter than reflection alone. Um, and what that's telling us is that the planet must be self-luminous. There must be some source of energy that's generating light over and beyond what we expect from reflection alone from the star. And what that's telling us about the planet is that the planet is young. Because if the planet is young, it's still gravita gravitationally contracting, and that provides a source of energy that makes the planet self-luminous. And we estimate that Fulmahope B is between 100 and 300 million years old. And you can kind of see that there is, especially this band of material here, there is kind of a remnant debris disk also sitting around um, this young star. So the fact that the planet is young and the, the, dis the uh, star still has this debris disk, it kind of uh, fits with, with um, gravitational contraction being the source of, of emission from this star. So direct imaging, very, very powerful, but most of the way that we find planets is through indirect methods. So just a little recap of the radial velocity method. As a planet orbits about its star, they orbit about their common center of mass. So the star actually moves a little bit as well as the planet is orbiting about it. So when the star is moving towards us, the lines are blue shifted and get closer, get, go to higher frequencies. And as the star is moving away from us, the uh, lines are red shifted and go to um, lower frequencies or, or longer wavelengths. So in the radial velocity method, we do not see the planet itself. We only see the impact of the planet on the star and in the star's spectrum. And the biggest signal we expect with the radial velocity method is for a planet that is quite massive, because it's able to push and pull on the star more strongly, but also one that's orbiting very close to the star so that we can see um, on a reasonable time scale that kind of push and pull on the star by the planet. So this is particularly sensitive to massive planets on short period uh, orbits. And then the second indirect method that we use is the transit method, and that's uh, shown here. So we have a planet, again, in orbit about its uh, parent star. If we look at this uh, edge on, we can see that here's uh, the light so as the planet passes in front of the star, 
we see a dip in the light curve um, and uh, that indicates that some um, object has moved across the star um, and has obscured some fraction of the light. It's usually of the order of a fraction of a percent for the biggest planets that we can then detect with very high sensitivity observations. So again, this, is, this um, um, particular uh, technique, it's indirect. We're not looking at the planet directly. We're looking at the impact of the planet on the starlight. And it's particularly sensitive to big planets, which can obscure more light, and also those that are on short period orbits again, so orbiting very close to the star, so that we can kind of pick up this transit signal over multiple epochs and actually confirm that it is indeed a bound object um, that is uh, obscuring the light from the star and just not something that kind of serendipi serendipitously passed uh, along the line of sight. So these methods have been incredibly successful and as I said we've detected around 4,800 planet planets mainly through radial velocity, mainly through transit technique, um, 4,800 planets around other stars so we now know very, very concretely that the number of planets in the universe is much greater than the number of stars, although that's not to say that every star uh, hosts a planet, but certainly we have more planets than stars. This is a really nice little video just to kind of end this lecture, showing you just how different our solar system looks compared with a lot of the other planetary systems that we have found um, to date. So here's our solar system here. And what you're looking at is basically a face-on view of the solar system where the planets are moving much faster than they do, but all the planets and the other solar systems are moving at, at the same uh, velocity, uh, relatively speaking. The uh, red planets are the warm planets. The blue planets are the cold planets. So you can see there's a huge temper temperature range here. And then you can also uh, see by the speed at which the planets are, are orbiting about their parent star, just how close in they are compared with the, the solar system planet. So I'll just play this little video so you can see. And this was this was the state of the exoplanet statistics about five years ago. So these are the all the planetary systems discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope, which was a space telescope that used the transit technique to detect planets. And as of May 2016, you can see that we had about 2,300 planets. So here's our solar system, very, very quiet with its multiple planets on what are wide period orbits. You can see some much, much closer, closer in planetary systems here. You can see some planetary systems that to date we only know of one planet, but much bigger than the planets in our solar system. Many of them are in much, much shorter period orbits than we've been able to, than, than what we have in our own solar system. Another thing to bear in mind is there's a lot of red in this plot as well. So a lot of the planets that we're finding are Jupiter or Neptune-sized planets that are actually quite warm. They're orbiting their star at much closer distances than our solar system. The reason for that is because of those biases in those two techniques. They are most sensitive to massive planets that are orbiting their star in short period orbits. So Unfortunately, to date, we've not found another planet system that looks like our own, but part of that story of why we haven't been able to do that is because of those systematic biases in the techniques that we use. And we hope that with the next generation of exoplanet um, detection um, telescopes, we will be able to actually see an Earth-like planet or an Earth-sized planet orbiting around a sun-like star. So another thing just to bear in mind from, from you know, this lecture, if you like, is that planet formation is a natural outcome of star formation, especially low mass star formation. The conservation of angular momentum, just the physics, dictates that we create these rotating flattened flat structures around young stars. And it's within those rotating flattened structures, what we call the disk, we naturally form planetary systems. And the other thing to take home here is that planetary systems show a remarkable diversity. We haven't found a solar system analogue because of biases in our techniques, but neither have we found two other planetary systems that look the same. They're all quite diverse in their own way, and it just shows you that this huge diversity in planetary systems is likely encoded in the different properties of, of these protoplanetary disks that, that we form naturally as a consequence of, of 
star formation. So just to finish, let us recap what we did in this second lecture. So we looked at the protoplanetary disk and we, we discussed that how they, they arise as a consequence of angular momentum conservation uh, during collapse. We talked also about the role of the disk in actually helping to accrete mass from the disk onto the new star. And that accretion shock that you create from those uh, bringing that gas along magnetic field lines means that these young stars are bright in this UV and X-ray emission. We talked about how we can try to directly see uh, these disks around young stars. We can image them in thermal emission, which we do at long wavelengths. We can also see them in scattered light at optical and near-infrared wavelengths. And I also briefly touched upon the fact that we can actually image them in molecular lines that reveal their velocity structure as well. And the final kind of key role of these disks is that they are the sites of planet formation. They're made out of dust and gas. And planet formation really starts with the coagulation of these small, tiny dust grains. Uh, but the physics of growth to kilometer size is still is one of the outstanding questions in planet formation theory. We know that it happens, but we don't quite understand how. We talked about the two main modes of gas giant planet formation, core accretion, which is how we think the gas giant planets in our solar system formed. But there's another mode of uh, gas giant planet formation, which is a gravitational instability, which is a process very analogous to the star formation that we talked about. We also introduced the concept of the snow line, so the point in the protoplanetary disk beyond which water ice can form, and how it discriminates between the inner rocky planet forming zone, where we only have rock available for building planets, and the gas and ice giant planet forming zone, where we not only have rock, we also have ice very important for creating a, a bump up in the mass we need to build the cores of giant, gas giant planets. We also talked about the concept of the minimum mass solar nebula, which describes the mass distribution of the disk within which the solar system formed, and what we'll come back to as well in the workshop. And finally, just at the end there, we talked about how we detect planets around other stars, and I also showed you how, at least to date, the planets that we're finding around other stars are very different from those in our solar system. So thank you very much for listening and I'll see you at the workshop.